Hello, folks. I am Rodney A. Brooks, and welcome to RodneyABrooks.com. We're today welcoming a special guest, Jennifer Belmont Jennings, um, trust in the state attorney at MGD Law in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, um, and I say special guest because Jennifer is both an attorney and a certified financial planner. And she was selected on the 40 under 40 list, the St. Louis Business Journal. Hello, Jennifer. Hello. <laughs> Next question was was on the living will and health care declarations. So, um, they are part of the state plan. How how uh, how important are those? And and um, you know how and, and do those those need to be updated also? Right. They're important if you care about who has the power to pull the plug in <laughs> your family, <laughs> right? And, you know, every Thanksgiving, that person could change. So, <laughs> I, you know, those are very important to express how you, you want to be treated, right? You can be specific on at, at what point you know, do they with, withhold certain treatments, like even fluids? And I think a lot of people get worried that when you have something like that, that the second you like are in a coma for five seconds, everyone's going to come in and pull the plug on you. It, that is not how it works. You, you know, hospitals don't want to get sued. And really what happens is you're putting in parameters that say, you know, if after this certain reasonable period of time, professional physicians, two physicians have said, I am not at all likely to recover. Like you're, you are going to be in this state indefinitely. You know, at that point, that's when I would uh, authorize the withholding of life-saving treatments. Um, you can say, keep me alive at all costs. I mean, I don't care what it takes. I mean, I don't know at some point, you know, the court could intervene. We've all seen that happen where you know, families are arguing over what to do and it goes to court, like the Terry Schiavo case. Um, I think a lot of people remember that. So uh, I think those are important because you you do want to have people you trust making decisions on your behalf when you can't, as long as you are there and alive and able to talk for yourself, they are going to talk to you. They are, they are not going to you know, say, but you wrote this thing in your living will. And if you're sitting here awake and alive saying, wait, don't pull the plug. I mean, they're not going to, you know, <laughs> not going to do that. So I think it's really important from that standpoint to make sure you have people you trust and also just to express what your wishes are, because a lot of families do argue over that. They don't know. You have one that's saying, no, they wouldn't want to live this way. And you have one that says, no, they told me that they, this is, this is what they want. If it's not written down, uh, in a way that complies with state statute, right? Remember, there's there's rules like they say, like witness, notarize, all that kind of stuff. Um, you, it, it's a lot more complicated and it's a lot more stressful for your family too. Then they're fighting and they're spending your money on lawyers to fight. And um, and but I think having those updated, that that's in the five year rule rule too, just to check in. And there could be new laws that pop up. You know, at one time there was no HIPAA. Right. And so you had all these documents that didn't even reference HIPAA. And now documents should reference HIPAA, you know, because all the hospitals, you know, are looking for the authorization to release information. So it is important to to regularly check in on those. OK, and you um, OK, so you talked in detail about the living will. So let's talk about those other documents. Uh, you know, the healthcare directive, um, the uh, financial um, guardianship type uh, type documents. Talk a little about all those other th things that should be part of the estate plan. Usually the healthcare directive and pow healthcare power of attorney, it's all typically bundled into one document. So you have the document that says release information to this person. This person can make you know, decisions on my behalf. And if something happens to me, this is what I want. Those tend to be, there could be states that do it differently. I don't know, but th those tend to be bundled into one document. The financial power of attorney, that is giving somebody the authority to sign things on your behalf, you know, write checks, you know, pay your rent, sign you up for you know, a contract to go into, a, you know, senior living or access your financial information. They're, they're basically able to be you. 
they're you. And so there are different kinds. There are kinds that do not go into effect until you become incapacitated. And there are kinds that are uh, go into effect immediately. Um, uh, lawyers have their preferences. I'm not personally a fan of what's called the springing power of attorney, you know, that only goes into effect when you're incapacitated because, you know, that's the whole getting the certifications of the physicians. And, and I'm of the mindset that, OK, well, if I don't trust these people today, why would I trust them only if I'm incapacitated? And, and if I've named people to be my agents in my financial power of attorney today, they, there are processes that they need to go through. You can't just walk into the bank and be like, hey, I'm the power of attorney, give me all their money. I mean, they're gonna check with me first. They're gonna call me. They're gonna make my agent sign an affidavit swearing under penalty of perjury and all the laws that you know I'm not able to do this and that they are authorized to act. It's not like you're giving somebody this power and they can go and buy houses in your names and, and, and they're all supposed to be acting in your best interest. And so there are statutes that govern that. So if they're abusing their authority, there are going to be consequences to that. Um, but it's it's certainly helpful. You know, you think about people who have required minimum distributions from IRAs when they um, and now it's not 70 and a half, but they keep changing the age as you get a little bit older. And um, you need a document that says the person has the authority to act on your behalf on your retirement accounts uh, so that they can pull that required distribution out. And so that is a document that's going to cover just the, the normal things in your financial life that you go about. Um, that goes into a bigger document conversation, which is a revocable living trust, uh, which I don't, do you want me to go down that road? Yes, got you. Because that was going to be my next question to okay. explain to explain because that's the one that I get most often in estate planning is explain yeah. the differences and the benefits of will versus trust. Right. Okay. So a trust. Think about that like some you know seventy page document, right? That packages up your financial life. And also sort of like that financial power of attorney gives a person who's called a trustee the authority to act on your behalf and do conduct certain transactions. And that document, it's sort of like a package, right? It, it When you are alive, that trust, is it's really you. Like you use your own social security number usually when you're you know, opening up a bank account or an investment account. But the difference is, is you are titling your assets. Your home may be titled in it. Your investment accounts, not your retirement accounts. You can't do that. I'll get to that later. But um, your regular investment accounts, bank accounts, even your car are going to be titled in the name of this trust. So it could be the Jennifer Jennings Revocable Trust. And when I have titled my assets in that name, it is still me. But if something happens to me, I've appointed successor trustees. You know, my husband is a trustee. He can act on my behalf and he can do things. So he can go to the bank and he can get money out. He can write checks. He can do all of that. Um, and then it also, that document also outlines how I want my property, be, property to be transferred. And inside that document, there's a lot of stuff. There is stuff that helps with estate tax planning. If you have an estate tax problem, there's language in there to help deal with retirement accounts uh, for people who are inheriting retirement accounts. If your trust is a beneficiary of one of your retirement accounts. And it basically lets me set up how I want money to be distributed and also how to take care of my family. So I had mentioned earlier that, you know, kids can't inherit property when they're 18 until they're 18. Um, but I can put in provisions that say, you know, until they're a certain age, this money is going to be used to take care of their education, their health, their support. And then when they reach a certain age, they can have some control control over it. You can give, you can, you know, give them varying levels of control. You don't ever have to give them control. You can have somebody else be in charge of the money. Um, but you can also keep it protected, right? There are certain things to do if they're going to get married in the future and you want to protect it from the future spouse or protect it from creditors. Uh, you know, there's no guarantees. I always say like, no guarantee. Like if some government entity or a court decides, you know, they're going to get access. I mean, it, 
it could happen. But for the most part, generally, these are great ways to have some asset protection and creditor protection for the future generations. You can't move your own money into this kind of trust I'm talking about to shield it from creditors. That does not work. It's it's you, um, but for your children. And so it allows you to do some extra tax planning and control the distributions. I think another thing that's important is um, if you have children or potentially children that are grandchildren that have special needs and they rely on government assistance, if they inherit money in their own name, that can uh, prevent them from having access to those government benefits that are looking at how much, you know, um, the assets they have. And there are special needs provisions that you can put into these documents that say it's like it, uh, it's a supplement to their their life. It doesn't supplant. It, it it's not the money is not used to pay for you know their housing or for their food. The things that the uh, the state you know like Medicaid or Social Security things that they're going to be looking at uh, for to gauge the asset level they have as to whether they give them benefits. Um, you can restrict that money so it doesn't interfere with it because a lot of times there are benefits that you're family members need that you can't just pay for even if you had like 20 million dollars and you could write a check to get this assistance it might not be available it might only be through some kind of state agency that they can get the help that they need so there are you can do that kind of planning um i think it it also avoids probate right so that's a big thing that comes up when people talk about wills so a will it's great and and it's good to have one um, but typically what a will is going to say is it's going to name a personal representative, you know, the executive of your state, people use different terms, it gives those people authority to do things like, you know, file taxes, your tax return on your behalf. But it also should have a line that says, if I forgot to put anything in my trust while I was alive, put it in my trust. And the stuff in your trust is going to pass I, do, I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't have some circumstance where there's a dispute or something goes to court, but generally speaking, those distributions all take place outside of the eyes of the court. When you just have a will, and, and let's say you didn't have beneficiaries on all of your accounts, because when you have a beneficiary listed, that passes outside of probate. But let's just say you, and trust me, there are plenty of people who don't have beneficiaries listed and don't do all that stuff. And the money ends up passing just by your will. It goes to probate. It goes to court. It's a public process. It costs money. You're paying. You could be paying a personal representative gets uh, fees um, if your will says that unless your will says that they're not entitled to fees. But um, you you're going to pay an attorney to walk everything through because there's documents you have to file. There's notices. So having the will, yes, in a sense, it does some things. But for most people, I don't, it's really not enough. I mean, you're you're still gonna end up in probate. And so having that trust is also a vehicle to keep you out of probate. And so even though there's that upfront cost to do it, generally speaking, even with updating it over time, probate is expensive. I mean, you can go look at the statutory minimum fees that a personal representative is entitled to, and you figure you're, you could be, you're paying a lawyer three to $600 an hour. Um, and then you've got family squabbling that comes up because there's confusion. And every time they ask a question, you're getting billed a point one or point two, you know, for that time. Um, so it's, it's a good thing to have as part of your estate plan. Also necessary if you're appointing guardians for your kids, right? That's the document that that is going to get approved. It's going to be used, right? If you're naming a guardian, somebody literally has to be appointed to take care of your kids. Um, but if you're past that phase of life, it's a great way to avoid probate by using the trust route uh, for distributing your assets.